Hi children, happy morning. What's up these days? Inside your home, right? Good children, stay home and stay safe because this coronavirus is really bothering every state of the human being. So it is our duty to take care of ourselves. Please stay inside your home children. Do not go out unless or until it is an emergency. Okay children, let's get back to the lesson. Then let's have a short recapitulation of the lesson, the expansion of British power from history. So what did we see in our last class children? The European countries began to form trading companies to trade with East, isn't it? So one of them was the English East India Company. This was started by the group of merchants. So in 1600, Queen Elizabeth I gave it a charter which granted the company the exclusive rights to trade with the East. So it means that no other trading group from England could compete with the East India Company. And the next topic which we learnt was arrival of trading companies. From the 17th century onwards, trading companies from Portugal, Holland, England, France and Denmark began to set up their base in India and they were being called as factories. In this, the English and the French became the key players, dominating trade between India and Europe. There was an Anglo-French rivalry, okay, that was being, you know, like commonly called as the Carnatic Wars, which was held in the Tamil Nadu. The English and the French clashed thrice in this Carnatic War and the wars lasted for nearly about 20 years. This, the French ceased to be a strong political force in India. So, the British established its power strongly in India. Then the British conquered Bengal uh, because of Battle of Plassey and Battle of Buxar. And then we finally saw the dual government which was been happening in Bengal. And the dual system of governance in Bengal ended up in 1772. So Bengal was directly brought under the control of the company. That is the new governor general Warren Hastings embarked on the further expansion of British influence in India. Let's see the growth of British influence. Okay, how did this British influence had completely taken over the other territories as well? The kingdoms of Mysore and the Marathas were the strongest rivals of the British during the second half of the 18th century. So the British wanted to launch a war against Marathas Mysore. Now let's see was with Mysore. The rulers Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, okay, they were the powerful rulers of Mysore. Now it's been called as Mysuru, okay. Who were the two rulers children, the powerful rulers? Hyder Ali and his son was Tipu Sultan rulers opposed British. Mysore controlled a large part of the spice trade. So Tipu Sultan did not want British to trade in this region. And one more reason was Tipu Sultan was close with French. That's why he completely disliked British. So British wanted to have a war against Mysore. So between 1766 and 1799, four wars were being fought between Mysore and British. In 1799, during the course of Fourth Anglo-Mysore War, British defeat Sultan. Tipu Sultan died on 4th May 1799 while defending his capital Seringapatinam. But you know what Tipu did? Sultan proudly declared that it was better to die like a soldier than to live a miserable dependent on infidels. The British conquered Mysore as well. And the next topic is wars with Marathas. The Marathas had become very weak after the defeat in the third battle of Panipat in 1761. The Peshwa was the head of the Maratha confederacy. In the third Anglo-Maratha war, British completely destroyed the Maratha power. Peshwa was sent to North India and his territories were being taken over by British. So the other Maratha chiefs were also forced to give up their territories and were no longer allowed to keep on army. 
British won the war with Mysore and the war with Marathas and conquered these two territories as well. Back to another topic, expansion under Lord Wellesley. Okay, that is from 1798 to 1805. After Warren Hastings, Lord Wellesley became the Governor General. He acquired territories through a very smart way of doing so. He had incorporated two rules that is system of subsidiary alliances and outright wars. Let's see what is a subsidiary alliance. What did they do in the subsidiary alliance? What is subsidiary? Subsidiary means a company holding another company. Okay, a company controlled by holding a another company. That is, British wanted to hold India with the help of their own power. So, this system of forming a subsidiary alliance was a very smart move from the British to take advantage of the rivalries among the Indian rulers. So, British wanted the Indian rulers to come under the subsidiary treaty and they wanted to sign the subsidiary treaty with them. In return, the British promised to protect the ruler from all the internal rebellions and from attacks by the rivals. So, the Indian rulers had to sign the subsidiary treaty by following three conditions. First condition was the Indian rulers should not keep any army of their own. Okay. And the next condition was they would keep a British army instead of having their own army. And the third condition was Indian rulers have to take permission from British before entering into an alliance with the another ruler or declaring war against the another kingdom. And the final condition was a British officer called the resident. Okay, a, a resident would be stationed in the ruler's court. No official of any other European power would be allowed in the court. These were the conditions which were being laid by British in order to have a subsidiary alliance with the Indian rulers. This subsidiary arrangement was very advantageous to British. The British could not maintain a large army at the cost of the Indian rulers. They indirectly controlled the defense and the foreign affairs of the protected. So, they completely overthrew the ruler and annexed his territories whenever they wished to. And this resident could interfere in the internal affairs of the kingdom to further the interest of the company. So, what happened? ruler who accepted the subsidiary alliance became totally dependent on British. So, he could not take any decisions on his own because the contract, I mean the subsidiary alliance which they have signed, you know, was kind of taking the supreme power over there. He signed the first subsidiary treaty with Nizam of Hyderabad in 1798 and then in 1801 the Nawab of Aud also signed a subsidiary treaty. Ishwa Baji Rao too signed a subsidiary treaty at Basian in 1802. What happened due to the subsidiary alliance, British became the supreme political power of India. See another topic, British expansion. There was a rapid expansion of British power in India between the years 1805 to 1848. There were almost 8 territories which have been conquered by British. They were Java, Sumatra, Singapore, Sarawak, Nepal, Burma, River Sutledge and Sindh. Now let's see why British has not conquered Punjab. Amongst the few Indian kingdoms that remain independent, one was Punjab. This Punjab was ruled by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Maharaja Ranjit Singh was very close with British. He was in the friendly terms with British. So British did not want to interfere in any, any of the affairs of the uh, kingdom. Maharaja Ranjit Singh also had a strong army equipped and trained like the European forces. Of Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1839, there was a struggle for power. In 1843, Dalip Singh, son of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, succeeded to the throne. The British defeated him and annexed Punjab in 1849. Children, let's come back to another topic, expansion under Lord Dalhus from 1848 to 1856. 
the first governor general of bengal that is warren hasting he started from 1772 to 1785 he was the first person to expand the british influence in india expansion which happened under lord wellesley that is from 1798 to 1805 and now the final expansion was under lord dalhousie that was happening under 1848 to 1856 lord dalhousie began the final stage of annexations he devised a policy called as doctrine of lapse what does this doctrine of lapse states it states that when the ruler of a kingdom under british protection that is the subsidiary state died without a natural heir his territory would not be automatically passed to the adopted heir so with the help of doctrine of lapse uh, this leader lord dalhous okay what did he do he annexed satara nagpur and jhansi and many other kingdoms under the doctrine of lapse now let's see how did he annex out important and a smart move which was done by dalhousie to annex the territories in india was misgovernment uh, like he wanted to blame wajid ali khan of out because that he accused of misrule and reluctance to introduce reforms just blaming the leader like saying that wajid ali khan was having a misgovernment he somehow annexed out in 1856 this created a lot of unrest among the indian soldiers the soldiers were not at all happy with what lord dalhousie has done okay so they were kind of really unrest because of this act where the two steps did uh, lord dalhousie take children the first one was doctrine of lapse and the second one was uh, just you know blaming the ruler saying that they had a misgovernment get back to structure of administration once the british started annexing the territories in india what did they do they wanted to have a proper system of administering these territories okay they wanted to formulate rules based on their profits they didn't even think the welfare of the common people okay so the company wanted to increase its profits from trade increase the profitability of territories and then strengthen its hold over india these were the three things the company was much concerned about they were not thinking about the welfare of the common people then the british divided the territories they held in india into provinces three of these that is bengal bombay now it's been called as mumbai and madras now it's been called as chennai they were all called as presidencies each presidency was administered by a governor with a governor general acting as the overall head the district was looked after by a collector he supervised the revenue collection and the overall administration of the district so there were lots of heads like you know they had a governor then they had a governor general and they had a collector as well to take care of the revenue collection the day to day administration was carried out by four agencies the first one was civil service and the next one was army to protect the territories then the police to maintain law and order and to ensure peace and finally the judiciary to dispense justice and this is the way they had a structured way of administering india not for the welfare of the uh, common people see how did the british have a structured way of administration with the help of civil service lord cornwallis started the civil service to effectively administer the company's territories in india what did he do for that he introduced strict regulations for officials raised their salaries and linked promotions to seniority so many bright young men were attracted to it to train in civil servants lord wellesley set up a fort william college at calcutta in 1801 looking at this you know strict regulations like raising the salaries and you know promotions are linked to seniority many young men got attracted towards this civil service okay so this uh, fort william college at calcutta in 1801 was kind of you know set up in order to train these civil servants the east india college in england was another institution which trained the young uh, recruits 
till 1853 the civil servants were nominated by the directors of the company but after 1853 the civil servants began to be selected through the competitive examination which was difficult for indians to get selected this was because the examination was held in london and very few indians could afford the cost to travel isn't it children since the examination was there in london many were not able to travel to uh, london in order to write this competitive exam because earlier you know they were being selected by the directors okay of the company but after 1853 they had the competitive exam year 2 which was held in london and the next one was the medium of expression was english which was a foreign language to the indians and finally the maximum age for uh, you know writing a competitive exam was very low the because of these three you know like uh, strategies they were not able indians were not able to compete with the uh, competitive exams the british had set up army in order to have a structured way of administering india just not for the welfare of the people just in order to conquer territories okay the first one was to conquer more territories and the second one was to protect british territories from their rivals and the third one was to protect the trading interest of the company and the final one was to surpass the internal revolts against the british the army comprised of indian soldiers who have been called as sepoys okay sepoys s e p o y s but you know in the hindi we used to call it as sipahi okay sipahi s i p a h i sipahi a large number of them were originally farmers they were very much keen to join this company's army because of the prestigious occupation most sepoys were recruited from areas of uh, you know uttar pradesh bihar and jharkhand so british officers commanded the sepoys the british army was well trained and a disciplined force the sepoys were armed with the muskets they were also paid a regular salary so the sepoys were loyal to the british masters though they had their own conscience of their state and religion the british found this out in 1857 when the sepoys revolted against the company that is though the sepoys were very much loyal to the british masters still when they had a revolt in 1857 they were just wanted to protect their own religion and caste they went against the uh, british officers the third pillar that is police the british needed an efficient police force in order to ensure law and order so what did lord cornwallis do he created a permanent police force in india like each district had many thanas each under a taroka towns and villages had a uh, kotwalis and chaukidars okay later the post of district superintendent of police was created he looked after the entire district like in the army in the police too indians were excluded from the higher posts in the army and in the police force our indians were been completely from the higher post the police was an effective force under the british it succeeded in reducing major crimes one of them being a thagi that is what is called thagi children thagi means a crime common in india when highway robbers uh, that is uh, you know they are called as thugs they killed the travelers and escaped with their valuables so the british reduced you know in succeeding this thagi whatever this police used to do still they were not been popular in the eyes of people you know why because they were unsympathetic then they were oppressive and they were corrupted now let's look at the fourth pillar the judiciary coming of british to india the indians followed laws based on local customs and traditions okay so so this british didn't wanted to disturb their laws they didn't wanted to create even further confusion in a kind of you know taking up their local customs and traditions and they decided that the british laws would apply only to the europeans the existence of two sets of laws will create confusions for the indians some of the indian traditions were written down in the form of laws and regulations this made laws uniform and uh, made easier to enforce warren hastings and lord cornwallis gave a proper shape to the judicial setup how did they give this uh, proper shape they had set up civil courts that is the diwani adalats and the criminal courts that is fauchdari adalats at the district level in 1833 a law commission was appointed to codify 
by the Indian laws. It compiled the Indian Penal Code that is IPC and established the principle of rule of law. This rule of law we will be learning in civics. Okay, It meant equality before law as it professed the ideal one law for all. This is what rule of law states. The rule of law states that one law for all that is everybody is equal in the eyes of law. So, the structural way of administration was happening with the civil service. The army also helped them to do so. Uh, then the uh, police and finally the judiciary. Okay, These were the four steps which were being taken by British in order to have a structural way of administration. Not to uh, think of the welfare of the uh, Indians. Just in order to uh, conquer more territories and in order to have a proper trading interest of the company. Now, let us have a quick recap of the lesson children okay india had a flourishing trade with other countries since ancient times trading companies from portugal holland england france and denmark set up their trading centers in different parts of india there was an intense rivalry amongst the trading companies so who were the trading companies children you know they were you know portugal holland england france and denmark and finally english east india company emerged victorious the company began to conquer territories in india to strengthen its position so the battle of palazzi that is in 1757 and that of buxar that is 1764 strengthened its position in india bengal came under british rule and it was severely exploited because of the dual role of administration the british defeated the rulers of mysore and the marathas and annexed their territories lord wellesley expanded british influence through the subsidiary alliance system many indian rulers accepted british supremacy isn't it children he did that right he what, what did lord wellesley uh, do he expanded the british uh, influence through this subsidiary alliance then the british annexed sin Punjab and Audin, 1843, 1849 and 1856. Lord Dalhus annexed many kingdoms after the doctrine of lapse. Then the company drafted administrative policies to govern uh, and to conquer territories. The administra administration rested on four pillars. The first one was the civil service, then the army, then police and the judiciary. So Warren Hastings and Lord Cornwallis shaped the working of this agency. So, I conclude to say that the British had come to India as traders, but the middle of 19th century, the British were the supreme power in India. They expanded their power, British power, by annexing lot of territories in India. Hope this lesson is clear to you children. Kindly attempt the questions which are there at the back of the book in page number 19. And just if you have any clarifications, do ping me in private. Take care children. Bye-bye.